Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us today for our Ask an Angler discussing fly fishing here in Oklahoma for our warm water species. So most uh, people associate um, fly fishing with trout or uh, ocean faring fish. So saltwater fishing, especially down in the warmer waters around Florida and some of the islands and Central America going for things like bonefish and redfish and tarpon. And then in the inland non seafaring parts, you know, people associate it with kind of mountain streams and trout fishing, even to some extent here in Oklahoma with our two year round trout fisheries and our seasonal trout fisheries. But what a lot of people don't associate fly fishing with is targeting warm water species, primarily our black bass species, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, spotted bass. Um, some of our non-game species, with which tend on average to be some of your bigger sized fish. So your river suckers, your carp, drum, buffalo, um, and then sunfish in ponds, white bass, hybrid striped bass, striped bass, things like that. All fly fishing is just a method to take. Um, and so one of the allures of fly fishing beyond just the different type of rod and reel fishing um, with the casting using a fly line to deliver your lure as opposed to the physical motion of actually flipping a rod and reel to send it. You're actually using the line as your delivery system to get that fly um, or other type of lure with a fly rod in front of uh, your fish species. So today we're going to go through kind of what your basic setup might look like for fly fishing, um, your rod and reel, your line, your leader, your tippet, what type of uh, fly patterns are going to be most productive for different types of species. We'll talk about some good um, access areas, public access areas that you can get to around the state. Um, for our warm water species, most of your fly fishing is going to be starting right about now, and it's going to run all the way into the fall. Once we get into kind of the winter months, then we have our trout fisheries, and that's going to be more productive for fly fishing. Um, so, Let's start off with uh, just kind of your rod and reel setup. What kind of equipment did you need to look for, whether you're just starting out in the sport, kind of getting your feet wet, or you've been doing it for a while and are just looking to maybe move away from trout and target some other species at the other times of the year. As with all these Ask an Anglers, please use the chat bar at any time as we go through the course to ask questions. Um, if I'm moving too fast through subject matter or you just you got something you want to say, just throw it in there. We'll address them as we go along so we don't have to wait till the end. So with fly fishing, two main components that differ from your traditional tackle, which is going to be either your spinning equipment, spin casting, or bait casting equipment. Um, the rods are, are typically on the longer size. So with traditional fishing, you're looking at using rods, usually somewhere in the six to seven foot range going all the way up to your surf rods at 12 feet and down to your micro light action at four and a half, five feet long. Most of your fly rods are going to range somewhere between seven and 12 feet, just depending on what weight uh, the fly rod is. And so with that, that's kind of one of the main differences that we'll touch on to begin with is what's the difference between, you know, your traditional rod versus your fly rod. So in your traditional rods, they're going to be labeled as something like ultra light, light, medium light, medium, medium heavy, heavy action rods or surf rods. In fly fishing, all of your different types of rods from that ultra light type rod all the way up to your heavy surf type rods are going to be listed by weight. So on your rod deck, it's going to have instead of saying power or or class, it's going to have something that is WT weight with the number associated with it. So on the lower end of your fly weight or your fly rod spectrum are going to be like your two and three to four weight. Uh, your medium action rods are going to be that five, six, and seven weight. And then your heavier action rods are going to be that eight, nine, 10 weight up to like 11, 12 weight type rods. But typically in here, here in Oklahoma for our warm water species, just depending on what you're targeting, your traditional, easy to find, we don't have a lot of fly shops in the state. So getting specialized fly fishing equipment is either going to come from like a big box retailer, a Bass Pro, Cabela's, um, maybe Academy or an Atwoods, just depending on where you're at and what their selection is to offer. Otherwise, you're looking online to order things um, 
to have delivered to you. But most of the time, what you're going to see in Oklahoma in big box stores are going to be your very standard weight classes. That's going to be a three weight on the lighter end, a five, maybe a six weight um, in that medium range, and then probably an eight weight on the heavier range. And that's really the class that you're looking to stick with here in Oklahoma. Um, if you're targeting like Clearwater creeks and streams for kind of the smaller size fish. If you're going after like sunfish and rock bass, smallmouth bass, you're probably going to be okay with like a three or a four weight. You know, five weight is that really good happy medium for fish that are under, you know, anywhere from a pound up to maybe four or five pounds. Um, and if you start targeting some of the larger species, your big largemouth bass, uh, hybrid striped bass, striped bass, you're going to want to be looking for something maybe in like the seven to eight range. If that's what you're specifically targeting, those rods and reel classes are meant to handle that type of weight. But for the most part here in Oklahoma, you're just getting started out or looking to get into the sport. You're really, you know, five or a six weight. That's going to be perfect. It's going to get you a lot of action through all spectrums of the different warm water species that you can go through. It's going to be fairly easy to cast. It's going to be in that medium size range, probably somewhere in the eight to nine foot class. And you really want to look for, you know, some of the cheaper end models that you can buy, like two piece rods, especially if you're new to the sport. The more expensive rods, they're going to come in shorter segments and you're probably going to have three or four pieces to put the rod together. So the two pieces that are in like the seven and a half foot range up to like the nine foot range are perfect for just getting started. And then for long time anglers, um, just for travel purposes, they'll fit easily in the back of a car when you break them in half, a little bit shorter tube that you can throw in. Um, so what I have here, this is my three weight Reddington rod. So this was my first ever fly rod that I got like 20 some years ago. And this thing has been with me everywhere across the country from trout and bass, salmon, steelhead. Um, I like using kind of lighter class rods, especially fishing like clear water creeks or if I'm fishing ponds, my three weight's going to get it done. And with that three weight, pretty small shaft on the rod deck here. So this is going to be more equivalent to like a medium light action rod down here at the base. And then the second piece of it is going to taper off. So it comes in two evenly sized pieces that are going to be, um, I believe this is a seven foot six rod. Yeah. So seven and a half foot rod. So I got two pieces that are kind of in that three and three quarter foot range. And then it goes all the way up to a tip that is pretty equivalent to like a light action or a medium light action rod. So if you're used to using traditional spinning or spin casting equipment in that medium, medium light action range, that three weight up to that five weight is going to be perfect. Now with fly rods, what differs, what you'll notice on the rod decks is on some rods, especially on your cheaper models, the lower half of the rod is probably going to have traditional eye guides that are going to look similar to what you would see on your traditional rod decks. As you go up the rod deck into the second piece, you're going to notice that your guides are a little bit different. They don't have that traditional um, circle on it that's attached to the rod deck with that little kind of guide clip. It's more of a weaved piece of metal. And what that is for is it allows for the line because unlike a spinning or a bait casting where the line is actually spooling off, because you're stripping lines straight off of your reel and throwing it out, it needs to be able to move through your guide. It doesn't need to have the spinning motion as it goes. So you'll have guides that look like this. And then that'll go all the way up and then you'll have some type of traditional rod tip end that's gonna be more of that circle class that's up on the top. So let's get to our reel. So pairing the appropriate sized reel with your rod deck, if you're just getting started out, you know, buying a combo set, a cheap combo set, Reddington is a very um, popular kind of starter model rod that have been around for a long time. They, you, you can kind of bang on them. They have fairly good sensitivity. Um, what you're going to see at the big box stores here in Oklahoma, especially if you go to a Cabela's or a Bass Pro, you're going to see their brand. So Bass Pro's fly shop brand, which is called White River, and they're going to have an assortment of um combo rods that are ready to go. You can always look online, Amazon, any of the big um, online shopping forums. You can type in three weight, five weight fly rods. You're going to get a lot of different options and price ranges on that. But getting something that already comes with that reel that's paired with the rod is going to help you just take out one step when you're getting started out. 
And what these reels are is the reels are going to have a weight class on them. And that weight class is going to be something similar or matching what the weight of the rod is. So it'll say, you know, three weight reel, four weight reel, five weight reel. And you want to pair, you know, either that reel or something within one number on that, just depending on how much line you want to hold and how you want to tailor your equipment. Then from there, you're going to have on your fly rod what is called backing line. And your backing line is what you spool on first. And all that is, is allowing you to kind of start to spool your reel so that when you attach your backing line to your fly line, you can fully spool up your reel. And so if you were to just put fly line directly onto the rod, then you're going to end up, you know, losing several feet of what could be either castable line or playing the fish line. And then from there, you're going to have your, um, fly line attached to what is known as a leader line and leader line and fly fishing are going to come in packages. So they're going to come in a package that looks something like this. That's going to have that leader in there and leaders are going to be weighted with an X. So it's going to say three X and in fly fishing, zero X is your, is your start, right? So zero X is as big of the line as it gets. When you start going down or you start adding up, so 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x, 6x, 7x, 8x, the higher the number, the lighter the line class. So once you get to 0x, from there, you'll find tippet and leader that is going to start to say the poundage instead of having that number. It's going to say like 15 pound leader or 20 pound leader. But 0x is kind of that starting point, and that's typically going to be somewhere between like 10 and 12 pound test. Here in Oklahoma, especially if you're using three weight up to like a six weight, you're more than likely going to be looking for a leader that's going to be packaged in either a 4x or a 5x. So on the packaging somewhere, you're going to see where that uh, weight class is as well as it's going to have a number associated with the feet. And that is how much line of the leader is. So in Oklahoma, because with our warm water species, we're typically not as concerned as some fly anglers might be like out West who are going to fly fish heavily pressured trout waters and crystal clear, where you really want to have a long leader line, a nether section, a tippet to really get your, fly away from your fly line because your fly line is always going to be some type of color. Think of it like braided line. So it's going to be highly visible to the fish and in pressured water, when you're trying to deliver a bug, you want to be as far away from your leader line as possible when you go to make that drift. So those fish are not associating, you know, fishing pressure and being hooked and uh, synthetics with uh, your delivery. So, but here in Oklahoma with our warm water species, a lot of times you're fishing in cloudy water, but even if you're fishing in one of our clear water streams, fish aren't heavily pressured. You're going to get away with a seven and a half foot leader to as your shortest, you might use a nine foot leader, but one of those two is plenty. You don't need to elect for like these big, long 12 foot leaders, three, four, five feet of tippet on the end. You're going to be just fine with like a seven and a half or a nine foot leader. Um, in 4X or 5X, uh, especially for most of your species. Now you get into the bigger species, your big largemouth bass, the temperate bass species, you might be using a seven or an eight weight uh, and your leader line is probably going to be more something like a 3X or maybe a 2X. And then you're going to pair your tippet uh, accordingly with that. And we'll get into that in a second. So here on our reel, we have our fly line which you have on, and then it's attached to your leader line. So you have a couple of different options when you put your fly line on your reel. Now it's always helpful if you're just getting started out that you go to a fly shop or you go to the big box chain when you buy your equipment. And more than likely there's gonna be somebody behind the counter who if you purchase the fly line in the backing, they might be able to help you right there in the store, show you how to put it on your, on your reel. If not, you can go to YouTube, type in how to put backing on a fly, reel, how to put fly, how to attach fly line to backing, how to attach leader lines to fly lines. And you're going to have hundreds, if not thousands of great educational videos from lots of reputable sources to help you along the way with that. If you just want to DIY it yourself at home, but a couple of quick tips just to get you started. So 
on this fly line, taking like a heavy piece of leader and tying like a nail knot and attaching it to your fly line is one way to go. But that's going to be a lot more um, kind of advanced or complex. There's a really easy way to just get right out of the box and attach yourself to your leader line. So I'm going to cut our fly line here and show the easiest way to do this. So instead of a nail knot or some other type of connector knot, like a double uni FG knot, blood knot, anything where you would be attaching two pieces of line, really the easiest way to do this is to just take your fly line and double it over and then just tie a simple little loop. Making the loop as small as you possibly can. So once you get it through, started through the hole, kind of start to cinch that knot up just to get it as close so your loop is not really any bigger than, you know, about your fingernail length. And then cinch that real tight. If you've got something that you can stick in there, like some pliers or forceps, and just make sure that you're really nice and tight on there. And then we're going to clip our excess tag end right here. We'll take that off and you get it as close to that knot as possible. Um, you should be pretty good and cinched up there. So we'll cut that off. We look just like this. So when you go and purchase your leader line and you're going to attach it to your fly line, you're going to get a couple of options. Your name brand lines, your Rio, uh, your Orvis, they are going to come with a loop on the end. So in most cases, you buy like the Cabela's brand. It's just going to have leader line in here. It's not going to have a loop. The Rio, the Orvis, they are going to have a loop. And a lot of times these are going to come in like a three pack. So you get some value. And these are just good overall leaders. Rio, Power Flex, usually says Trout on it. That's the leader that you're looking for if you're going to kind of get the next class up. But the cheapest stuff right here, something, you know, not brand name, just a generic, whatever the big box stores deal is. Only difference on these is they're not going to have that loop attached on it. So when we go to take this out of the package and we pull it out, these are tapered lines. So your fly line is all going to be one consistency and it's going to be one weight class. Now, when you're looking to get fly line in Oklahoma, especially if you're just starting out, you're going to want to get the fly line that is appropriate for the reel and you're going to want to get a floating line as opposed to like a sink tip line or sinking line. That's just not really going to be necessary unless you want to get really advanced into the sport, fishing from a boat, get out on the big water, fishing for stripers, fishing for largemouth bass in water that's deeper than five, six, seven feet. So you're starting to fish in the water column all the way to 20 feet down. Then you're going to need sinking line to throw. But we won't discuss that in this. This is just kind of your basic uh, fly fishing to get you started here in Oklahoma. So you're going to get your leader line unwound. Just make sure you keep it all loose. They kind of wrap it around uh, each other so you don't want to get any knots in there. So just slowly work it. It's usually wound and you can start on one end, but just getting it all undone. Now your leader line is going to be tapered. What that means is that on the end that you're going to attach to your fly line is going to be the thickest of the line. And then when you get all the way down to the tip, it's going to be what that weight class is. So down here at the end, this being, uh, which one did I open? A, a 4X. So this is going to be the equivalent of six pound test. So right down here, right at the end, this would be like spooling your spinning reel, bait casting reel with just six pound test. That's going to be your break strength. So we're going to come back up here to the beginning of our leader line. And like I said, when you buy the generic ones, it's probably not going to have a pre-made loop on it. So we need to make a loop. So just like we did with the fly line, we're going to double that line over and then make a simple loop again, trying to keep that loop as small as possible so that we don't have a bunch of wonky kind of waves where it connects. Again, once you do that loop, get something in there, make sure you pull it nice and tight so there's just no slippage. And then cinch down that tag end. And then we'll clip the tag end off. Again, trying to clip it about as close to that knot as you can get without compromising the knot. All 
All right, so now we've got our loop right here. Make sure you get it kind of straightened out a little bit. So now we're gonna connect our fly line to our leader line using these loops. So you can do it one of two ways, either way it's gonna be come out the same. The easiest way to do it, take your loop on your fly line, pinch it together and push it through the loop on the leader line that you made. And then just simply pull that loop up over the knot of your fly line. Then we're gonna take the end of our leader line And we're going to go, so whatever side your knot is on, on your leader line, make sure you're coming through the loop on that side. So in this case, it's the bottom side. So we're going to come up through that loop and we're going to pull all that excess leader through. And then we're going to pull the loop on the leader up over the uh, knot on the fly line. And we're going to pull it tight. Now we are connected. We're ready to go. So. We've got all the way down to the end of our leader line. So now the part comes where we need to string our line onto our fly rod. And instead of what you would do with your traditional tackle, where you're gonna grab the end of that line and hold the end of the line and work it through each guide, because your fly line is much heavier than uh, your leader line, what you're gonna find if you take that route if you drop it, it's coming all the way back through. So the easiest what thing you can do is pull out maybe four or five feet of your fly line, double your fly line over like this, and then we're going to work the fly line because it'll easily pull off of the reel, and we're going to string it up all the way up the guides like this. This way, you have better grip. That fly line's a lot bigger than your leader is, so you don't have to worry about losing it. And then once you start to get towards the top, you can start to pull a lot of that excess that you had so you don't end up with you know too much fly line off when you go to tie on. And you just work that all the way through every single one of those guides, making sure that you stay on the bottom side, don't accidentally wrap it around the rod deck or you're going to run into some problems. But... Get this all the way up and through. And then once you get through the top, just start pulling that excess. So work it. And once you get that knot, your connector through, then it's going to come through nice and easy. And get that all the way through. And now we're strung up. So once you get your rod and reel set up as we have, now what do you do? You got two options. You can tie your first fly directly onto the end of that leader. But if you do that, that tapered section, you're only going to get to about right here. So you're only going to get about a foot to 18 inches of usable line before you really start to get into the thicker part of that leader. And you're just not going to be able to tie, you know, improved clinch knots or a trialene knot. Those are usually the common knots that people are going to tie flies on low profile. They cinch down the line. So if you want to give yourself some chew line, one of the first things that anybody should do when they're learning how to fish, whether it be fly fishing, traditional fishing, is knot tying. Once you can tie knots, I mean, it just is going to make fishing so much simpler, so much more enjoyable, um, especially with fly fishing, because if you're trying to match hatches, if you're changing lures a lot, you don't have the luxury of having an entire spool full of the same line where you can keep cutting down and cutting down and cutting down. You know, you can lose 20 feet of line tying on and off throughout the day with traditional tackle and you really don't lose any line. Um, but with this, you're only going to get to tie on, you know, maybe four or five bugs with this chew line before you start to run out of it. So the simplest option there is tying yourself on tippet or essentially a leader to a leader. And with tippet, tippet's going to come in these nice little circular spools that typically don't have a ton of line on them, maybe like 30 yards, something like that. But they make them to where you can kind of push and clip all your different fly tippets together. So with this, we put on 4X. So we have two good options that we want to do with tying on tippet. You either want to tie on the same tippet 
as your leader. So if you put on a 4X leader, you want to put 4X tippet on. Or you can go one size lower, so moving up in numbers, and put on a 5X tippet. So just what ends up happening is when you use the 4 or a 3X leader, that leader's a little bit thicker and you might want to get a presentation where you're using a much thinner, like a two pound or four pound break strength, which is going to be your five X, your six X um, and tie that on. That gives you your chew line and it provides you a few feet of basically invisibility under the water with those really light line classes. So tying your connecting your leader to your tippet. So for this, we'll use 4X. We'll just match it with the same line that is on the leader. So you're going to have this nice little hole that comes out and it basically protects that spool from the line coming out, which is great because it holds it in place. You don't need to like tie it down or put a piece of tape on it like you would with like a traditional line spool where it comes with the piece of tape and the little notch to secure your line. So we want to pull off Decent amount of line, you know, maybe two feet, just enough so you got plenty of uh, tag to work with. And your two knots that you're going to attach with, if you take that route, are going to either be a um, blood knot, which is what I prefer, or a double uni knot. Either one's going to be fine. The blood knot is a nicer connector knot when you get through it it's just a little bit more low profile that double uni knot is going to be pretty close to that but it's going to be a little bit bigger so the blood knot is harder to tie than the double uni so you really just kind of either got to practice or figure out which one works best for you but with a blood knot what we want to do is we want to pull about six or seven eight inches a line past each other so the leader line coming this way and our tippet going the other way. We have a little notch on here on the tippet. I'm gonna get rid of that real quick. Doesn't wanna play nice. All right, so pull each side six to eight inches apart from each other so they're crossing. Then you can go either direction. I usually start with the leader line side first. But we're going to wrap it around that tippet line that we've pulled through the other direction five to seven times. The lighter the line, the more times you can go because it'll cinch up tighter. But we'll do five here just to start because it is a difficult knot to tie. Mainly, it's a difficult knot to cinch tight. That's where you run into problems. The actual getting there is not that difficult. So we've wrapped around five times. And up here, we've got our tag end of our tippet and the main line of our leader. We're gonna take the tag end that we just created from our tippet end that we wrapped around. So right here, you kinda of wanna use your other fingers and just make sure you can keep that V open. And then you're gonna take your tag end of your tippet and get it through that V. So now when we grab the, oops, now when we grab the tag end of the leader line, we're gonna wrap around going the opposite direction back up the leader line. So we've got that secured. Make sure you come up over the top first to make sure that that uh, tippet line gets secured on there. And it's just gonna be holding, didn't give myself quite enough. Uh, tag there. So if you can get that secured off to where you can kind of pinch that down and just keep it out of the way, then we're going to make our five loops or five twists this way up the leader line. And your tippet tag end. We've created a loop here in the middle where that line is going through. You're going to run this second tag end in the op. You're going to run it back through the loop in the direction facing away from where you brought your leader line through. So this is the easy part. We've got our both tag ends through our loop and we've got our twists on the line. So it's going to look something like that. 
this is where you can run into problems. So it's very important. Make sure you really wet down your line with spit. So just make sure that you got plenty on there so the line doesn't try to stick to each other. And typically what I do is I'll put one piece in my mouth and pull the other one downward. And then you pull them in opposite directions until it cinches up. But the thing is, is that you got to get it started first. You have to have tension on those two tag ends or they'll jump. And then you'll notice when you go to pull it together, you're going to have these kind of twists or loops there. This is what it should look like when that knot is tied. Nice, pretty, low profile with both of those tag ends coming out at the same spot in opposite directions. And then from there, I forgot my clippers today. So we have scissors, which is not ideal because we can't get quite as close. But you want to clip, if you have your little nippers, you want to clip that thing right on the knot. I mean, just right up against it. So there is either, you know, a very microscopic amount of tag hanging out or none at all. So for there, and then how much tippet do you use now that we're tied on? So that's really just going to be dependent on your casting ability and why you're tying on tippet in the first place. So if you're just tying it on for some shoe line, you probably only want to take, you know, an arm's length at, at best. So two feet like this. And that's going to be plenty. That two feet is going to buy you a bunch of bugs to be able to tie on. And as you chew away at this line, you chew away, chew away, chew away. You've been tying your bugs on. Now we've gotten really close to where our blood knot is at. Once you get up to about right here, well, then you're going to cut your leader line and you're going to tie on another set of tippet. And you're probably going to be able to do that three to five times for the lifetime of the leader. Eventually you will get too far up the leader. It's going to start getting thicker. That's time to tie a new leader on and then begin again with this. But if you were really looking to kind of get some distance between you and your leader line for whatever reason, you might elect instead of going 4X to 4X or whatever your uh, leader and tippet size are to maybe a 4X to a 5X. And then you might take like three feet of line. But understand the whole purpose of fly fishing when you're throwing these lines to get that nice kind of quintessential river runs through it, tight loop that goes back and then it whips through. The longer this tippet line is, because of it's not tapered, it's all the same consistency, the more chance there is for to not only get wind knots, but if you're not perfectly behind, if you don't get the line completely straightened out to the bug behind you, when you go to pass through, you're going to get a little bit of wonkiness in that bug when it's trying to fly through the air. Your line might not go. So sticking to two feet or less a tippet is going to help with your casting. So... We've made it through that. So now you're set up, you're ready to go fishing. So let's kind of talk about our different species, different places to go and what bugs you might look to use. Now, the great thing about fly fishing, especially for warm water species, because there isn't a ton of history behind that, you can kind of get creative. You know, there's not, you find information online that isn't just purist, dry fly fishing, matching hatches. You know, you can throw some hard lures on the end of your fly line. You could use like a super duper. You could tie on like 164th ounce jigs with tubes or small little soft plastic creature baits. If you're like fishing Clearwater Creeks for smallmouth bass or sunfish, they're going to fly just like your beadhead, you know, jig flies would do a woolly bugger or a clouser minnow. In some cases of like a 164th ounce um jig head on some type of tube it's actually going to fly just as well as like a dry fly would it'll fly better than some of your bigger bead heads just because the the size so i'm a, i'm a big advocate of i try to fish with the method of take that's going to be the most productive depending on where i'm at so if it is fly fishing especially if it's warm water species and i'm going to a creek a lot of times i won't even mess around with actual true flies i'll tie on little tubes little inch and a half tubes or small creature baits and work those just with my fly rod. It just offers a different presentation because I have my floating fly line. A lot of times I can kind of keep that uh, lure higher or in different depths of the water column by controlling it. Um, 
but you got lots of different options when it comes to to doing your warm water fishing here in the state so let's start off with just bass that's going to be most people's primary target when they first start off fly fishing if they're going to target warm water species they're going to be largemouth bass smallmouth bass and then spotted bass are usually caught incidentally where they occur when you're fishing for one of the two other species of black bass so with largemouth bass fishing if you're just getting started out right you're more than likely looking at fishing either small creeks and rivers or like farm ponds close to home ponds neighborhood ponds anywhere where you got some shoreline where you got some good distance behind you and you can make those back casts. And in those cases, if you're going to be using flies to target, you know, largemouth bass, you're going to probably start out by electing for some of your bigger classes of flies, your streamers, your jig flies, your specialty flies. So I'm going to throw a couple of links over here in the chat bar. The first one is going to be Blaine Chocolate's Changer series, which are flies but they are tied in an articulated fashion. And so they're essentially flies that fish like swim baits and anybody in traditional tackle bass fishing these days, swim baits are all the rage and they're one of the top, you know, artificial lures that's out there. So there's been flies that have been developed to mimic that similar action that you get with a swim bait that's so productive and now it's in a fly pattern. So that's the first link. Another link, this next one, is for Dirty Water Fly Co., which is a fly fishing shop that started out of the Bozeman area in Montana. And the guy who owns it, Dan Salto, he has a lot of experience with uh, non-trout fishing, redfish, largemouth bass. And he moved from Montana down to Plano, Texas. And so Dirty Water Fly Co. now has a shop in Plano and they're opening up another area a fly shop there in North Texas. So you live in Oklahoma, you ever get down to Texas, that is a great place to stop off at or to call to ask questions um, about bass fishing uh, with the fly rod. And he's also going to have a ton. He, he specializes in tying jig flies and these big jig flies he created for saltwater anglers, for catching big gnarly trout um, that go after bigger baits or targeting, you know, trophy class trout. And he makes a, a series that is specifically made for uh, targeting largemouth bass, particularly big largemouth bass. So those are two good resources to check out um, where you can order stuff online. You got good phone numbers, good contact information and get a little bit more background on bass fishing for um, with a fly rod. So when you go out to your pond or your creek, you know, you're going to be looking at you utilizing these bigger jig flies that are going to be similar to what you would look for in your soft plastics or your hard lures that you would use with traditional tackle to target bass. So um, when you're in like creeks and rivers, big portion of their diet is going to be, you know, bait fish and it's going to be crawfish. So you go to any of the big box retailers, the Bass Pros and Cabela's, well, a lot of the specialty type flies, things that you might look for to match particular hatches on certain bodies of water, um, you may not find those. But what you will find is a lot of assortments of um, bass style flies. So big jig flies, they got almost bass hooks on them, jig heads, and then your different feather and hackle that comes through. And this is a good, really good color scheme right here. You know, in Oklahoma... You've watched any of these asking anglers when we're talking about bass fishing and we're talking about like river and creek fishing for bass. My main go-to color scheme is always going to be something in a green pumpkin base. So looking for flies that also are kind of starting with that olive green pumpkin, very natural colors that might have a little red or orange flash even better. So flies like this, or if you wanted to go the more flashy, um, reactionary here's the same exact fly in more of that red craw pattern but this is going to be a good one for a lot of our uh, stream bait fish our shiners our darters they're going to have a lot of banding in them and so you get a lot of good color these are two really good color schemes to look for when you're bass fishing in rivers whether it be specialty jig flies like these or utilizing something, you know, more traditional like a rubber-legged um, 
or just strict beadhead woolly bugger. And in those cases, again, similar color schemes. Largemouth bass have a better propensity to things with more of that June bug purple. But again, the green pumpkin, olive bases with some orange or red flash mixed in, those are always going to be kind of your top bugs to look for to start. And the great thing about bass fishing, you know, in a pond, you're going to be in still water. So you're going to be casting to a fixed location, allowing for that bug to sink a little bit. You'll have your floating fly line, and then you're just going to be given quick strips of the line. So two, three, four inch pulls of the line in quick succession. You can pause just like you would with the jerk bait. And you're just going to work that fly back in until you probably get your fly line about 10 feet from you. And then you're going to pick up from there, give yourself another, you know, maybe 10 to 20 feet of extra line out, drop that bug right back down and go right back to it. Now, when you're fishing in creeks and rivers where you have that moving water, you're going to be looking to cast 45 degrees upstream in good areas, runs, tail outs, hole dump ins. And instead of quick stripping immediately, you're going to do what's called swinging a fly. So you're going to allow your fly line to sit up on top of the water. And in most fishing with fly rods, if you're throwing a dry fly or you're nymphing either with or without a strike indicator, you're going to hear get, you know, upriver men's get the bow out of your line. Make sure that you're getting your fly line up above that bug. So you get a drag free drift, which makes it look more natural in the water for species like trout that will sit in a feeding lane and they're looking for bug larva, other things that are going to be coming down in kind of a linear fashion. With our warm water species, you don't have to worry as much about slapping down casts onto the water. So I am a big proponent of people who are starting out fly fishing to start in the summertime, start with ponds, start with small rivers and creeks, and really get accustomed to casting because you can make a lot more casting mistakes for warm water species and still be catching and getting bites than you're going to get when you're trout fishing where fish are a lot spookier. You really need to try to get those drag free drifts going. Um, and you don't want to be slapping your line or slapping your bug or slapping your stripe indicator down on the water. Cause trout are just a lot um, more easily spooked. A lot of our warm water species, that big splash or that big thud on the water, a lot of times gets their attention. Um, they're looking for terrestrial bugs, bait fish disturbances on the water surface and sometimes slapping that bug down like a big dry fly like a hopper or a stimulator pattern um, see some of our dry so in the summertime when you're going to be doing this fishing if you're not doing the swing where you're allowing your line to bow and it's going to drag your fly and the farther downstream that your bow gets the faster that fly is going to start moving in the water and essentially once your bow has gotten even with you and downstream that's when you start doing a few quick strips and work that bug and kind of get it out into the run or if you can get your line back behind like a boulder or a log lay down just twitching that bug in and out of those boulders and logs and things like that. And then once it's downstream and you, the great thing about moving water, just let that current take your bug all the way to where your line is tight. So just allow that line to drift down. And then with that tension, you can just pick your line up and snap it right back upstream. No false casting. Um, the big mistake that I see with new fly anglers, too much casting, way too much false casting. The more, think about it this way, the longer your bug's not in the water, you're not catching fish, right? Those fish aren't going to come up and grab it out of the air. So all false casting is, is just a method to get the amount of line you need and get it on the water. The less false cast you use, the less likelihood of getting the inevitable problems with fly fishing, which are going to be number one, wind knots. What will happen is you'll get too many casts, you'll get slack in your line, you're not tight the whole way, that bug will loop. It'll come back through and you'll end up with these little tiny, you know, sometimes you don't even notice them. They're so small wind knots. And when you put a knot in a line like that, an overhand knot, what happens is the second you get tension on it, it's going to snap right there at the knot. So you end up losing a lot of fish when you get those wind knots in your line. So that needs to be avoided, you know, right off the bat. And in rivers, creeks, moving water, especially here in Oklahoma, places like Barron Fork Creek, that is a great place to go start off learning how to fly fish. Big, wide gravel flood plains, not a lot of bank overhang, pretty much open water. It's just a great place to learn how to cast, catch a lot of fish, build that confidence up. Um, 
but you get to a place like Blue River where you really don't have any back casting, especially if you're fishing from the bank, you got to be out in the water. Then you're looking at straight downstream and upstream cast and you have so much overhang in those good sections of water that you can wade. You really don't have the luxury of being able to back cast. So you need to learn how to either allow, you know, you can just strip line right when you get on the water, just toss your bug out into the water in the current and start stripping off an appropriate amount of line until you got the right amount of line behind you for how far you want to cast upstream. And because it's already on the water, you just whip it right back upstream, keeps that bug nice and low. It doesn't bring in the overhanging branches into play. And then you can work that bug back down, allow it to get all the way down behind you and go. Now, if you're going cross current or a little bit upstream, so you're casting more perpendicular with the current, that's when roll casting comes into play. Maybe that thing has gotten right down even with you, but there's not enough current to make sense to wait, you know, a minute or two for it to get downstream of you. So from that point, you know, flip twitching your line down so you have a little bit of slack in it and as you shoot it back towards you you use that rod tip and it'll basically fold the line over on itself and do a cartwheel and put your bug right back where you need to go but starting off on ponds where you can get a lot of false casting sitting on still water or being in small creeks and streams lots of casting area that's really when you can work on those things and get better with the false casting because the false casting is just going to hurt you when you're first starting off or you're trying something new. Um, the big bugs, especially, you know, they're going to be wonky. The heavier that weight is on the end of the fly line, the harder it is to get a nice, good cadence where it's coming all the way through, all the way back, all the way through. Um, you know, one of the big common uh, casting mistakes is people don't wait long enough when they throw it behind them. So they're already coming through before that bug has gotten all the way back to straighten out the line that has slack in it. It just rolls it over. You don't end up being able to throw it as far out in front of you. And that's when you get the tumbling and you get the wind knots. Um, so, and another thing is too much arm. So fly fishing is mostly elbow up. So the fly rod is just an extension of your body, but you start getting wonky with your arm. You lose a lot of that tension on the rod tip. So it really is just an elbow to your wrist and you're using that wrist to snap it. And if you're only using your wrist because of how your wrist is built, you really can't, you know, it's, it's not a natural motion to fold your wrist all the way back like this. So what it does is it keeps your, uh, keeps the tip of your rod in that perfect range where you want it at, which is 10 o'clock to two o'clock. So when that, rod tip is up above you and you're like this we'll call that two o'clock we'll call that 10 o'clock so if you're keeping your casting to right here you're going to get that cadence going where you can feel the bug whip all the way back you start getting your arm involved and things like that you're not going to it's going to be harder to keep a consistent cadence back and forth now another thing that you can do before you even get on the water is just put your fly line on get it all rigged up your leader and your tippet don't tie anything onto it. Just practice casting the line in your yard. And that way you can actually really watch it. So you get that cadence of seeing where that line is at in front, where it's at in back. And you're just working that right back. And the great thing about fishing, all types of fishing, especially fly fishing, the common principle is to obviously keep that rod tip 10 to two. You start getting it down to nine o'clock and back to three, you're gonna run into some problems. But Everybody is going to figure out their cadence and their rhythm differently. It's all about just making sure your bug is tight behind you and then tight in front of you. And that's going to help eliminate all those wind knots and some of the casting problems that you'll run into when you get started with fly fishing. So just something to keep in mind. So your woolly buggers, we we're talking about the jig flies, woolly buggers. Um, I don't know if I have my streamer box with me. Here's a, so like a Clouser minnow, that's going to be another common fly that you're going to see at your big box retailers. And this is just going to be your good basic bait fish imitator. But again, got that olive green pumpkin back with that white underbelly and some uh, ripple flash that goes through it. Anything like this in our creeks and streams is going to be great. You start getting into uh, your ponds and things of that nature, you know, Big woolly buggers, big streamers, chocolate changers, st stuff like this that you can cast a little bit farther. 
get it down this and like a June bug, uh, an olive, a orange, black, white, something like that, basic, and stripping. Uh, what else do we got? So that kind of covers, you know, your basic largemouth bass fishing. It's going to be a lot of swinging flies in rivers or, um, or working, you know, subsurface. Now, as we get into the summer months, once we get post spawn here, usually typically kind of starts kicking off in about middle of May, depending on what part of the state you're in, you're going to start getting some top water activity. Now with your largemouth bass and with your smallmouth bass, you got a couple different options just depending on where you're at. If you're in still water ponds, you're going to be looking at using like what's called bass, like popper bugs um, or things that are similar that are going to be up on the surface. So most bass bugs, the big, big brand that you're going to see at your big box stores here in Oklahoma, it's going to be Bet's, B-E-T-T -T, apostrophe S. And Bet's bass bugs, they usually come in a package, cardboard package with some plastic on it. And it's going to have an assortment of, you know, three to five different size little popper flies. You'll also see other ones that, you know, this is essentially what your popper is looking like. Got that big concave nose on it, and it's shaped basically like your traditional tackle of using poppers or topwater lures. Got that concave mouth, but it's typically in a smaller profile than even some of your smallest like hula poppers or other things that you might use on top. You also have bugs that instead of popping, they have foam on them, so they stay on the top. And these ones, you give quick strips and they stay across the top of the water. With the top water action, you know, you're going to get it both in the ponds as well as in your creeks and streams. Creeks and streams, you're more likely to get that top water bite throughout the course of the day. Whereas if you're fishing the still water of a pond, early mornings, late evenings, typical times for largemouth to push shallow, start looking uh, above the surface for terrestrials, frogs ducklings, snakes, lizards, bait fish, sunfish, anything up towards the top. But basic poppers or, you know, again, in Oklahoma, you're kind of limited with our, with your fly selections if you're not ordering online. But you're going to be able to find stuff like this, foam bodies, got all those good color patterns that you would see in your traditional top water that you'd use on spinning or bait casting equipment. But anytime you're fishing in moving water, creeks and creeks and rivers, all fly casting is going to be done upstream. So you don't have the luxury of a lot of weight on your line that you do that you might with a big jig head or something like that on bait casting or spin casting equipment, or you might be casting straight cross current or maybe even a little bit downstream into a pool. With fly fishing, it is almost always upstream because you need time for that bug to sink down a little bit, especially when you're subsurface. Or if you're using a dry fly and you want to get a nice long drift, Sometimes, depending on, you know, where you're at with the current in between you and your bug, casting straight upstream, you can just slowly strip, especially that topwater bug, you kind of want it to move anyways, just picking up your line as it comes back to you. But if you are casting upstream, the second it hits the water, you can throw that big upriver mend into your line, and then that's going to allow for the quicker current, more than likely, that's in between you and where your bug's at to bring your line, but it's going to allow for a drag free drift with that. Now with poppers and things like this, we're not doing a drag free drift where we are moving it. So as we cast it across 45 degrees upstream, we're immediately working that bug because we're trying to create some surface disruption. Now your more traditional dry flies that we do want the drag free drift are terrestrial bugs or our big hatching bugs. Um, that's going to be more of the drag free drift. They're going to be looking for stuff. But if you go, especially with bass fishing, like hoppers, terrestrial bugs. So things that are foam bodied or um, let's see if we got a big stimulator. So here's a small like size 14 stimulator, something like this, where you're going to need some floating to keep that above. The big foam body ones, you don't really need to put floating on it. It's always a good idea anytime you're using dry flies just to get some floating on it. But the difference between this is with that big foam body, it's going to sit up high. This, if you don't put uh, floating on it and occasionally bring it back to you so you can blow off some of that water because all that floating is, is it's basically like a thick, oily goo that essentially is waterproof. So it keeps the water from penetrating the hairs and fibers of the fly, which will ultimately result in it sinking. It helps it keep it up on the surface. But occasionally 
with the ones that aren't the foam body, you need to just blow them off real quick and then a couple of false casts to really get them dry, set it right back down. But with bugs like these, with the stimulator, stimulators are great. You know, when you can get stimulators size eight all the way up to like size 16, these are going to be one of your most versatile dry flies that you're going to use in any type of fishing, um, but are really going to come in handy with your warm water species, your panfish, your bass, because it imi it's a stimulator. It imitates a lot of different things. If you've ever watched any of these courses, I'm a big advocate of utilizing baits that have multiple range of what they could be. So I'm a big advocate of tubes. I'm also a big advocate of stimulators in fly fishing when you're using the top. Could be a grasshopper, could be an ant, could be a mayfly, could be a stonefly, could be a caddisfly. You get a lot of the same properties of all these different types of very singular flies mixed into one type of bug. But with your hoppers and things like this, terrestrials, when they land on the water, they're not supposed to be there. So grasshoppers, you walk by the bank, something disturbs them, wind blows too hard. They end up on the water. They make a lot of commotion because they have they can't lift off and fly like a mayfly or caddisfly or dragonfly or something like that. That's very graceful sitting down on the water and picking up. Terrestrial bugs are in panic mode. So starting off with stimulators or hoppers, something where you're going to get that terrestrial pattern going, you can smack them down on the water and then you don't really need a drag free drift. You can kind of, if that bug picks up some speed occasionally, or it creates kind of a wake in the water, which is what you don't want with matching hatches like mayflies or caddisflies, um, where you really want a true drag free drift because those types of bugs are not creating surface disruptions. Um, starting off, with the bass species and your panfish, get yourself some big foam body bugs, easy to see, sit up on the top without a lot of help. That's really going to cut a lot of corners to build up that confidence in fly fishing to move on to some of the more advanced techniques, matching hatches, things like that. You're more prepared for it, but you're catching fish. That's the biggest thing with fly fishing is unlike any of the other types of fishing, there are a lot of things working against you when you first start. Number one being just getting the rod and reel rigged up correctly, then casting, then presenting the fly in a way that's in the right spot. And maybe it's not doing what it's supposed to do when it is in the right spot. So there's a lot of barriers that you got to overcome to really get ingrained in the fly fishing culture. But getting started off, clear water streams and your ponds, you're going to get to eliminate a lot of those barriers because you don't have to worry about the casting as much. You don't have to worry about slapping the bugs down. You don't have to worry about not having drag free drifts or being able to get those good upriver mends. Those will come with time and you can practice those things while you're targeting these fish and any mishap you have is more than likely not going to result in getting a strike. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting great practice and you're also building confidence from hook sets, landing fish, playing fish on the fly rod. All of that is going to be brand new to you if you've never done it before. So eliminating the hard barriers while still having the success and learning the different principles while you're out there. I mean, it's a win-win. So sticking with big foamy bugs or poppers or hoppers, anything like that that's going to sit up on the surface is going to be the quickest way to get you into fish, especially as we get into the summer months, late May, all the way through October, you're going to have the opportunity to take a fly rod out. I recommend Barren Fork. If you live, especially if you live on the Eastern half of the state or you're willing to make a drive, you know, if you live in Oklahoma city, it's about a three hour drive. Um, but we have two uh, public properties, Bamberger WMA, Barren Fork WMA, Bamberger WMA is where I'd recommend to go fly fishing. It's the easiest access to the water from the parking area. You got about a mile of stream that you can work with. You can go upstream or downstream of the parking area. And anywhere you go, you're going to have these big, huge, wide gravel flood plains, not a lot of bank overhang, not a lot of debris in the water. You're going to be able to make tons and tons and tons of casts. And you're going to be catching lots and lots and lots of smallmouth and um, a lot of sunfish species. And it's great because the fish are going to, on average, a big smallmouth in that section of river is going to be three pounds. I mean, that's going to be a world-class fish in Barren Fork. So mostly you're going to be dealing with fish that are going to be in the eight to 14 inch range, which are perfect fish to learn how to play them, fight them, either get them to, to your reel or just straight hand strip them in. You're going to start to learn those things as well. Because when you're in moving water and you try to hand line them in, you're going to realize you're throwing your floating fly line onto the water. The current's going to start taking your fly line away. So it's great. You get the fish in, 
but then you realize you've got, you know, 20, 30 feet of line that's down river of you. And now it's sucking your fly. Once you get it off of the unhooked from the fish, it's going to pull it up to that rod tip. So it's a good place to learn. Once you hook up into that fish, maybe you've made a few strips, you've got, let's say, you know, this much a line off. Well, then that's a good time to learn how to get, you know, when you're stripping, you've got it right here. Play that fish, keep that line pinched up against your cork, and then reel up your line so that now you can play the fish on the reel and play it all the way in. And that way you don't have the big mess of line out um, when it comes to it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some nymph fishing because nymph fishing is for bass, for panfish species, um, you're going to get kind of a lot of the same things. So if you're fishing on a pond, you can use in the fly fishing world, it's called the strike indicator. To everybody else, it's a bobber. Only difference between these and an actual bobber is that they don't have a fixed clip or a slip. So they've got an opening, usually smaller on one side, bigger on the other. If you're going to get strike indicators and you're new to this sport, get these big, nice plastic ones. Super easy, visible, super easy to get on your line. There's lots of specialty type. Um, oh, we got our tangled up over in the chairs. Um, so the great thing about these, like I said, you can find specialty strike indicators, uh, ones that are made more out of like fur or cloth that you got to put floating on. These are great. You don't need to do anything with them and they're super easy to put on your line. So on that bigger hole side of the two, that's where we're going to put our line through. And with these, just like what we've pretty much done for everything else, we're just going to double our line over. So you're going to go up your leader line. And again, from whatever the end of your line is to where that bobber is, that's the amount of line that you could potentially get in the water column. So you're going to want to match your bobber up with getting your bait middle of the water column to bottom third of the water column without actually hitting the bottom because we want to be able to indicate strikes as opposed to our nymph hitting the ground or hitting the stream bed where it's going to look like it's a bite and you don't want to do that. So knowing what depth of water you're in, you're going to come up your line, you know, at least that far to a couple, three, four feet less than that, depending on water depth. So we take that bent over line and we're going to stick that loop through that big end opening and it'll come out and now you'll have that loop again. So we're going to take that loop and we're just going to force the strike indicator through the loop and then we're going to pull and cinch tight. Simple. See, that's as easy as it gets. And this is going to float. They come in high vis colors, orange, yellow, pink, white. I like the orange ones really easy for me to see. I don't have great eyes. Um, so this is super easy, noticeable. You can follow that. So from there, you tie on your flies. Now in trout fishing, you do some research, you read some magazine, you're going to see a lot of different types of like droppers. So either a dry dropper, having a dry bug, and then a nymph underneath it. All of these are going to come in time, but they're not something that you should just immediately right out the box be trying to attempt because they're going to come with their own set of barriers, wind knots, twists, just attaching the line on the right places, tying on the right knots. Stick with one bug to start and build your confidence from there. Because again, casting this bobber attached to a nymph, keep it as simple as possible. So it's still, this is pretty light. It's not going to provide a lot of resistance on your line, like a bead head or a jig fly would. So it's still going to fly pretty good. It's going to feel a lot like a dry fly would. And you're going to be able to make some good casts. So for your um, nymph flies, what you might be looking to use, and again, these are going to be ones that you're going to find at your big box retailers. So with our smallmouth, with our pan fish, we're not having to be quite as picky as we are with trout, where we might need to be matching not only the right bug for the right time of year, but also the size of the bug as well. With your warm water species, they're going to be a lot less picky. They're going to be going after things that look like food. So a good starting nymph fly is going to either be a pheasant tail, a beadhead pheasant tail, or like a beadhead prince nymph. 
Those two, you're going to be able to find those at any fly shop in America, and you're going to find them at the big box retailers. So this is a pheasant tail. So pheasant tails are uh, mayfly imitators. So they're mayfly nymphs. Mayflies are abundant. They exist all over the state. So they're going to be in every body of water fisher used to seeing their larva. Now, when we're trout fishing, you know, this is a pretty big nymph right here. This is going to be running in more of that, you know, 10 size, 10 size, 12. Most of the time you're trout fishing, you're using mayflies um, or any other type of nymphs. You're going to be more in that 16, 18, 20, 22 size class. Really, really, really tiny bugs. Because most of the time when you're fishing, especially pressured water, the smaller your bug, the more likely you are to get bit. The bigger it is, the more they can see it. You know, they probably see a lot more of them because people don't like tying on those really, really tiny bugs. They're harder to get your knot on. You know, they're easy to drop and they're sometimes harder, you know, for some people to cast. You get a lot of twists because they're so light. So sticking with like a size 10, size 12 prince nymph or pheasant tail nymph with some type of flashback. You know, usually they come in like a green or a purple, get that little extra flash on them. And you would just tie these directly on. So anytime you're tying on uh, your fly, you want to go in through the non-hook side. So if your hook's on this side, you want to be coming through the eye hole on the other side of that hook. And then usually just a improved clinch. So you got your leader on there, four X, five twists is gonna be plenty. You can go up to seven, you'll be able to make that knot. So your improved clinch, you're gonna tie, you're gonna twist that bug around to create that spiral. You're gonna do that five to seven times. Then down at the base of the eye hole, I don't know if it'll focus or not, but there on our line, right above that eye hole is going to be a little circle gap that we're going to work our line through that gap. And I got a little bit of a kink in this line, so does not want to cooperate. So we'll bring that through our loop. And again, you want to leave yourself a little bit more tag end than I just gave, just so you can see it a little bit better, especially when you're out on the water, low visibility with the sunlight and things that can distract. But then you bring it through and then you bring it back through the loop that you made. Wet it, cinch it down tight, good to go, clip off your tag in. And all you're doing with these is casting again, like 45 degrees upstream. So we'd be flipping this upstream. And with this, you can practice keeping that drag free. So when you are nymphing, you do want, if you're using any type of, you know, nymph fly, whether it be like a big uh, stone fly imitator. Let's see what bugs we got here. So we've got any big stone flies in any of these boxes. Yellow sallies are good. Um, well, here's just the ones you'll find at Bass Pro. I don't have any fancier ones, but these are just rubber-legged stone fly imitators. But you want to get the ones with the big bead heads on them. Throw in a bigger one, you might get into some, you know, bass that are willing to give take. Anything with rubber legs is going to get hit, um, especially in your natural colors, your browns, your blacks, olives, whites. Um, but if you're not going to go with the pheasant tail or maybe something flashy like, you know, a, a disco midge or a lightning bug, Bloody Mary, Copper John, something that's got a lot of flash in it. Uh, I really like like a rubber legged yellow Sally. Again, most of these bugs, they're going to have the little three tail off the back, which is going to be our mayfly imitators. And in these, they're going to come in some type of either yellow Sally, like the name implies, or kind of a tan yellow color. But those would be my two go-to nymphs. Like if I wanted to just get out there, maybe teach somebody new who hadn't fly fished and just give them a bobber setup so they have a really good indication of when it submerges or stops or twitches to set the hook, I'm going to be looking at medium-sized uh, nymphs that are going to be either probably a prince nymph pattern or a pheasant tail. 
pattern or a yellow cell Sally pattern, and they're all going to be bead heads. So a lot of times you'll see something in the fly fishing world for a fly labeled BH and then the name BH stands for bead head. And the bead head is that little brass uh, ball right there below what's attached to the eye guide. And that's weight. Think of it like a jig head. Um, and then you'll have nymph flies that do not have the bead head on them that are more of like a soft hackle, like uh, pupa flies, um, emerging flies, midges. Midges typically don't have bead heads on them. And they're going to be in those smaller classes like that. And you're just going to have that eye hole without the bead head at the front. But again, just getting out of the box, size 10, size 12, maybe size 14 nymphs, bead head, something in a pheasant tail, or if they have some little flashy ones like a caddis pupa. So your caddis pupas are going to be more of that kind of olive color. And some of them do come with that nice bead head on it. And you could throw something like that. We do have caddis hatches around the state. They tend not to be as prevalent as our mayfly hatches do. So usually sticking with pheasant tails that are imitating a, um, imitating a uh, mayfly. It's going to go a little bit farther for you. And then some flashier flies like Bloody Mary type flies, inchworms. You know, anything like that, San Juan worms, you got a wide range of flies that you can throw. But the ones, again, being here in Oklahoma, where we don't have easy, easy access to a lot of fly shops, there is a new fly shop that replaced the old one over on 122nd in May over by Lake Hefner. So if you live in Oklahoma City, right there in that strip mall, right there on the northwest corner of 122nd in May, there is a new fly shop that replaced Backwoods that was there. So that is a place that you can go and get, um, your own flies, uh, or some more specialty flies. If you're in the Oklahoma city area, uh, do you tie any of your own flies? Uh, I haven't in a long time. Um, but that is something, a lot of guys, they find more fun tying flies than they actually do fishing the flies. So can be very good, uh, stress relieving tying flies, but I've got boxes that I've had for some of these flies that have been in here for 20 years. So I usually have a pretty good group. I haven't had need to tie flies in a while. So, um, but here's all of these bugs in here in this box. These were all bought at Bass Pro here in Oklahoma City. So they're going to have the same ones up at the Bass Pro up in Broken Arrow. But any of these types of bugs over here, these different types of pheasant tails, a lot of them have rubber legs. Again, you take a pheasant tail size 10, size 12, size 14, and then it has rubber legs. Great. You're just adding more for those warm water species. So that pheasant tail that we showed earlier, here's pretty much the same bug, except it's got some added rubber legs. So we get a good hybrid of kind of that yellow Sally and the pheasant tail um, or a copper John where we're getting that really good color scheme. But anytime you got rubber legs with, uh, with your nymph patterns here in Oklahoma, especially in your clear water creeks and streams where you want to float. Great. You can also throw this same exact rig. So some type of pheasant tail, rubber legs or not, bead head, and your strike indicator. This is the perfect depth for a pond. You know, not quite two feet, about 18 inches, foot and a half. Throw this out like you would fish a bobber and a worm or a bobber and a crappie nibble or bobber and a kernel of corn for a panfish. You go out to any pond, especially here in about probably in the next two to three weeks, really, when those sunfish are really looking to get their spawn going on, they're going to be gathered in, you know, the thousands in some locations, especially in your small neighborhood ponds, farm ponds, easy access. If you can make bat casts, you can either throw a bobber out and literally just let it sit there and wait for it to submerge and set the hook. Or you can throw these little nymphs out there, especially the rubber legged ones no strike indicator, cast them out to your location, let it sink for a second and a couple of strip quick strips at a time. And you'll get that tug away. You'll watch your floating fly line on the top 
And when you're stripping it, more than likely, the bite's going to kind of come in that weird period where you're kind of slacked on the line. Um, but you'll watch your fly line shoot forward or twitch, and that indicates to set the hook. So those are really good learning principles that you'll want to employ the farther down the road you get into fly fishing and you start targeting species um, or fishing a certain technique with the fly that really is more reliant on you watching your fly line more so than it is actually feeling, you know, or visually seeing a bobber go under or visually seeing a topwater strike or swinging a fly where you kind of have tension on the line and you'll feel the hit and also see that line shoot. So really good option for sunfish and you will catch some bass. I mean, if there's bass up in the area and you're quick stripping a little pheasant tail or a little, uh, stone fly anything like that that a sunfish can get in its mouth if there's large mouth in the area especially your smaller large mouth your 10 12 maybe 14 inches they'll be more than willing to go take one of those little rubber legged nips so great way to just get yourself going um is you know a nymph box that really doesn't have a whole lot to it you know there's not a lot in here these are just basically some different styles of of pheasant tails um, and some prince nymphs over here. And the prince nymphs, these are going to be good ones um, in your ponds as well. Those prince nymphs, a lot of them come with, I don't know how well we can see it here in the light, but more of a purple base and that purple flash. And again, all of our warm water species, especially our sunfish species, so our largemouth bass, all different species of sunfish and crappie, they're really going to key in on that purple tint. That's a really good color pattern for our species of sunfish. So rubber legged, not rubber legged, bead head size 10 to size 14, pheasant tails, prince nymphs. You really don't need much more than that to get yourself started out the store, ready to go fishing. And then assortment of here's some more like bass box with our different types of woolly buggers and kind of jig flies along with some top water poppers and then some terrestrial big bugs, some grasshopper type flies. That's really all you need. You don't, you don't need much more, but if you wanted to kind of explore in the realm, go and do a dirty water fly code, looking at their specialty jig flies, Blaine's uh, chocolate changers, those are going to be, you know, your specialty flies that you can order online and experiment with those, but they're just really not necessary. You're going to get a lot of value out of your cheap generic Bass Pro, Cabela's, Academy, if they sell flies, you know, you're going to get a lot of value out of those for our warm water species. Um, some things that you'll want to also have with you as you get into fly fishing are going to be things like split shot, floating, sinking uh, gink to put on. So you'll see things to put on wet strut flies and streamer flies to help them sink a little bit better. And then you'll have your floating, which is to keep those bugs up on top of the water. So things like this, and they'll typically be labeled with, you know, like this, it's going to say for wet flies, for streamers, for woolly buggers, things that you really want to get down. This is just going to help it kind of get that wetness. Cause when those flies come out of the box, especially your woolly buggers, you really kind of need to hold them in the water, submerge them for a minute to get them nice and wet. So when you do throw out, you get a little bit quicker sink rate, get into the strike zone faster. And then anything like this is just the basic White River Bass Pro. It's called that float doctor, but you're going to, you can find it lots of different brands, um, especially if you get into more like specialty fly shops, I'll have a lot of different brands that sell floating. But those are two things that you'll want to have on you. Obviously some different sizes of tippet, typically sticking with like 4X, 5X and 6X just for our stuff in Oklahoma, if you're doing pond fishing or creek or river fishing, that's going to be plenty. Um, then you have your fly line and leader straightener. If it gets a little kinked, you just run your line through that, pinch it together and pull it down your line to kind of get some of those kinks or twists. If it's been either sitting on the reel too long or it was wound up in the package and got hot or something and started to hold that memory, that's going to help you with getting that memory out of the line, straighten that line out. Uh, you're, we're not using traditional pliers in fly fishing. You're using forceps, much smaller hooks, even on our bigger uh, style flies. They're still going to be a lot smaller than what you'd see in your traditional terminal or, you know, bass lure hooks. So real small ends on to get down and get your hook out. 
Um, and then a uh, pair of nippers, real small. You know, you don't need the big like fingernail type clippers. You can, little fly clippers will typically have a little uh, pin on one side of them. And those are sometimes stuff gets in the eye hole and you need to open up the eye hole to thread your line through. And then split shot. And you want to buy split shot in the fly fishing section of big box retailers. Um, if you go to a fly shop, they're obviously going to have that. But it's going to be much smaller than what you would be used to as far as um, split shot that you'd buy for like cat fishing, bobber and worm fishing for sunfish. They're not going to have that little piece on the back to open with your fingers. They're going to be just a singular um, circle. So once you cramp them onto the line, the only way to get them off is to cut above or to remove your bug and slide them down the line. So it's just going to be a perfect circle with that opening. And you would put that on if you needed to get down to deeper depth. So with fly fishing, you don't, a lot of times you don't have the option of really sizing up the jig head or the bead head to get that sink rate or to get it down into the water column where you need it. So split shot becomes your best friend. Usually just one piece of split shot is enough here in Oklahoma. If you're fishing the clear water creeks or streams or you're pond fishing, usually it's not necessary, but if you are in some swifter moving water um, and you're not using one of the big heavy jig flies, you're using more of like a bead head woolly bugger, or maybe even a clouser minnow that's got a slower sink rate, you might throw on a piece of split shot four, six inches up above where you're tied on. And that's just going to help it get down a little bit quicker. And it really won't, shouldn't throw too much of a, a wrinkle into your casting ability with it. Um, okay. So what fly do you use for sand bass and stripers? So good segue. We've kind of gone through all of the basic stuff for your sunfish species and ponds and rivers and creeks. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the temperate bass species, which is going to be that kind of other realm of what you would get into um, when you're out fly fishing. And then we'll talk a little bit about non-game species, but the non-game species, they're going to be going for the real, they are going to be more like trout in what they're looking to take. So your buffalo, your drum, your red horse, your river suckers, your carp, they're going to be keyed in usually on something very specific. And that's when kind of matching the size profile and knowing what the bugs that are in the water are. But a lot of times, small flashy flies like lightning bugs, prince nymphs, but real small. When you're targeting the, those bigger fish, a lot of times you're not going to get away with that size 8, 10, 12, 14 bug. You're really going to need to be using like 18, 20, 22s, something really, really small and getting it right down uh, near the bottom to get some of those. Um, non-game fish but with our stripers and our um, hybrids and our white bass you're going to be looking for color schemes that are very similar to what you'd be using if you're using live bait or you're using traditional lures like uh, jigs now because of how you throw them and i talked about you know using non-traditional flies on fly lines like tubes like small creature baits small shaved metal baits like super dupers you can do the same thing for white bass you can go get yourself a cheap pack like 199 a 10 pack of like 132nd ounce or maybe even 116th ounce if you feel confident throwing you know that heavy of a jig uh of just little beetle bows you know little hair jigs little marabou jigs those are going to work just like a, you know, a woolly bugger in white wood. But that's really what you're looking. Clouser minnows, um, the Blaine's chocolate changers, especially in those shad patterns, uh, white woolly buggers, or any type of jig fly that are going to have those very common white bass colors. So your whites, silvers, flashy chartreuses, um, that's really what you're going to be looking to use. Now, the difference being... For the most part, unless you have surfacing fish, most of the time, other than the hybrids that kind of tend to stay more middle of the water column, your sand bass, especially your sand bass, they're going to be down on the bottom um, more often. If they're not surface feeding, they're very rarely mid water column. They're usually down in that bottom third of the water column. So 
this is a great time of year to attempt to fly fish for them. Uh, places like Horseshoe Bend on the upper Illinois, just above 10 killer. That's a place where you can wade out into the water. You can get some good bat casting. You know, that would probably be my recommendation. I mean, for white bass fishing with the fly starting off right now at Horseshoe Bend, you know, basically from the last week of March all the way through the end of April, utilizing that Horseshoe Bend area, throw in white woolly buggers, clouser minnows, specialty jig flies, anything that is in that white silver chartreuse pattern. Um, Floating line is probably going to be okay. You may need sinking line, sink tip line, but you could probably load your leader up with split shot. That's what I would do instead of, you know, unless you have a ton of fly rods and one of them's already rigged with, you know, sinking line or sink tip line. Your floating line is fine. I mean, those white bass are going to be all the way out from the middle of the river channel. If you've ever been to Horseshoe Bend, you know, it's a good solid hundred plus yards across right there at the bend. And it's a gradual slope from the parking side that gets out to the main river channel. But ton, there's so many white bass. I mean, just hundreds of thousands, if not millions of white bass that are moving up and down through that portion of river for a five, six week period here in the spring. A lot of those fish are going to be very near the bank that you're fishing from. So maybe one, two pieces of split shot, three pieces of split shot, in addition to that white woolly bugger or some specialty jig fly, anything in white chartreuse, white and chartreuse, white with ripple flash through it, just something like that, very basic. Um, and then loading up your split shot, you know, maybe six inches above the line. And with that, because the water doesn't really move through there, you don't have a whole lot of current, you can elect to cast straight, you know, perpendicular with the bait. Allow that to fall down as far as you can. If you if you can even watch your line sink to where you know it hit the bottom, from there, just quick strips all the way in. So just, you know, three-inch strip, three-inch strip, three-inch strip, three-inch strip, three-inch strip until you watch the end of your fly line get you know, depending on your casting, it's going to be, you're going to be down in the bottom of the water column. The closer you get it to you, the harder it's going to be to false cast to get it back out. So just depending on how um, well you can cast, how much actual line you can get off uh, when you get to where that bug lands in the water, you know, maybe 10, 12 strips and then pick that thing up and throw it right back out. Don't let it get too close to you unless you've obviously hooked up on a fish. And that's going to be the easiest kind of starter place to go to get into white bass and have a good opportunity from fishing from the bank, wading out into the water, big wide floodplain again, lots of water around it, lots of places even in the peak of the run to find you got a ton of space from the parking area walking the trails all the way around the bend you're going to be able to find yourself a spot on the shoreline to yourself to be able to cast so that's where i'd recommend to go now with your stripers you know that's that's a whole different ball game with the stripers and the hybrid stripe bass that is really getting into a more difficult level of fly fishing mainly because you need to be out on a boat you're just not going to have a lot of opportunities to do it from the bank. You know, when the striper run up the lower Illinois during the summer, when they're generating, that's still too much water to wade. Um, you're pulling up anywhere above 2000 CFS. You can't wade that river. So you're out there on a boat. Um, and then you're more than likely using bigger rods and reels. So you're using like an eight, seven, eight weight rod, zero X leader, zero X tippet, or, um, I don't know if I have any, I think I ran out of all my bigger leader, but you know, your two X you're starting out with at least a two X leader all the way up to a zero X leader. And then you're using tippet in that zero X. Um, and then our two X three X you're using real big line. Um, so typically that's kind of farther along the way, but you would be looking to target stripers with real big flies. You know, you're, Real big flesh flies, uh, streamers, specialty size flies. Um, they're, those are going to come in like two, three aught hooks. So you're getting that much bigger size profile. But again, unless you've got surface feeding going on, most of the time your temperate bass species, the hybrids and stripers are probably going to be mid water column or somewhere below that. And then your white bass are really going to be hunkered down towards the bottom when they're not just up on top feeding. And when they're up on top feeding, then looking at something in that white or chartreuse pattern that you can squirt skirt across the top that 
are with those like foam bodies, something like these. You could also elect for, you know, different types of poppers in a chartreuse or a white, but that's what you're going to be looking to use for those white bass. You're not going to be, you're more than likely not going to be catching a whole bunch if you're in the right place for white bass with, you know, dry flies, stimulators, poppers, or running any type of like pheasant tails or um, prince nymphs, stonefly nymphs. It's not to say it doesn't make up, you know, some portion of their diet. They all fish are opportunistic feeders, but um, your white bass and striped bass and hybrids really key in on shad and minnows as their primary forage base. So sticking to things that imitate those like clouser minnows, like woolly buggers, um, specialty jig flies, those are going to get your best value as far as trying to hook up into those types of fish. So got about a half an hour left. If you got any questions, throw them over in the chat bar. Let's just talk about some areas that you might look to go and how you might look to target fish. Um, we've got some pretty good public access spots around the state where you can go uh, for fly fishing. I mentioned Blue River earlier. Blue River is a great place to go. Um, you got lots of water to fish. You got a lot of different unique species that are in there. So you're going to get a lot of value. It is just a much tougher casting. Um, unless you're willing to just go tough it out at one of the, the low water or some of the big kind of trout areas that you've got open bank or you can get out in the middle of the river on a waterfall and cast straight up and down. The fun of Blue River is really working wet wading and getting in through those braided sections of river where you're getting into a lot of fish. You can get into some big fish and some small water, but your casting zone is, is almost non-existent. So you are either allowing your line downstream and flipping it back up or your roll casting. You're not going to get the opportunity for traditional false casting in really any of those braided areas. Um, I've mentioned Barren Fork. That is definitely the, the Barren Fork or just the upper Illinois is going to be your two places where you're going to have that big, wide gravel floodplain, not a lot of overhang, um, where you can make a lot of casts and you can get into fish and you can get into a lot of different types of fish. And typically the fishing is at its best when you can wet wade, when it's fun. You might be able to group it in with like a camping trip, a family float trip. You're already over in the area. Um, so that's those are our two really good places that you can go. You also got the the lower mountain fork during the summer months. You can trout fish, but there's also going to be some warm water species that are going to be mixed in on the lower mountain fork, especially the farther downstream of the tailway that you get. So once you get past the 259 bridges and you start getting into the southern part of the park, especially below the re-reg dams, a little bit bigger water, but you're going to, it's warmer water, doesn't move as fast. You're going to find your bass, maybe some walleye, maybe some white bass. You're going to have more diversity of those warm water species downstream on the mountain fork. Obviously ponds, um, close to home ponds, neighborhood ponds, your own pond, farm pond, family land, anything like that where you can make casts. Right now, really all the way through the summer into the fall is going to be a good time to get out and do that. Um, but, you know, your big reservoirs, your big bodies of water, not really where you're going to be looking to fly fish. You're not going to have a lot of great bank access for casting because you're either going to be standing, you know, you're going to have the wind driving through you if you're out on points going to have the riprap on dams that are going to be angled up so you can't really back cast so you really want to be looking at you know starting out with ponds as we're in april and may and then once we get middle half of may later half of may just depending on flooding you want to look at start getting over to those public uh, access on those clear water creeks and streams barren fork kind of being the jewel upper illinois being a good option mountain fork um not a lot of casting that you can get at, but Rock Creek right there in the Arbuckles. It's the north arm. It runs through the uh, Chickasaw uh, NRA right there behind Veterans Lake. You can park and walk down that creek. You have got public access to that. It's crystal clear. It's kind of a, it's definitely better than Blue River as far as having the ability to make some casts, but it is still pretty tight in through that. You can wade maybe a mile downstream on it. Pretty easy to, to wade through. Um, that area. There's lots of areas down in the Southeast that have access. Um, Glover river. You just need a land access permit to get onto the uh, Honobi wildlife management area. And the Glover river runs through that. That's a good one. You're going to have a lot of that pocket water and it's going to be kind of a 
a better version of Blue River as far as casting. Again, it's still going to be fairly tight. It's not going to be as good as the Mountain Fork or Barron Fork or Illinois for casting, but it's a good in-between um, if you're kind of in that intermediate stage of casting. That's a good one. Um, and then Prairie Streams, you know, not overlooking like, you know, a Cimarron or the Canadians, Washita, anywhere we can get onto the water there. You can tie on like rope lures for gar. Um, you can throw some woolly buggers. You can try nymphing. You might get into, you know, the occasional channel cat that comes and takes a swing at a beadhead nymph or really it's fun targeting gar when those gar start to spawn here, probably in the next month or so, they're going to be looking to use those small uh, tributaries that are off of our prairie stream. So good access places are like the Cimarron and Ripley, the Cimarron um, just north of Guthrie off of Highway 77. There's lots of access to like the Canadian. Um, you can get on the Canadian a couple places in like Jones and Choctaw. Then on the south side, you get a little bit farther east. You got access points in like Earlsboro. Um, and you can really just kind of Google map the prairie streams of the state, look for right away turnoffs that are clearly there for people to go fish and get in there. And then, um, you can get on, I would just YouTube how to, you know, how to fly fish for gar and just see what, you know, different people's opinions are on what flies to use. You can use hook flies like clouds or minnows, woolly buggers, things in white chartreuse, things with lots of flash in them just bigger sizes that you would use for like white bass, but you can also tie rope lures. So you get a small swivel, take some nylon white rope, maybe some ripple flash thread. You just basically take a wire brush, untangle all the strands of the nylon rope. So you cut it so you can open it up, take apart all the strands, wire brush it out. So it gets frayed and it looks like a clouser minnow type off the back. And then you just take a small barrel swivel, pull one, just a little bit of the tag end of that rope through, maybe add some fly fishing, like ripple flash to it, blue or silver or black, and then zip tie it off and clip off your zip tie. And you throw that because with gar, you can't really set a hook with gar most of the time. Every now and then you get lucky and you peg them in the corner of the mouth, but that hard casing on the inside of their mouth and all their teeth just makes it very difficult to hook them up with a, a hook. But when you throw nylon rope at them that's feathered out and it's made to look like a streamer, you throw that out there without a hook, they bite onto it, they can't get out of that nylon. So you're hooked up. The only way they can get off is to break your line. And gar are a ton of fun, um, especially fly fishing, because they're essentially freshwater tarpon. If you hook a gar in the mouth, they're almost always going to go airborne on you, especially in the warm water months. So they're going to tail walk. They're going to tear line up and down. So it's always just a better option than like bow fishing for gar where you shoot a gar and they really don't have much fight to them because, you know, unless it's an alligator gar, even your big long nose gar are only going to be about that big around. You shoot a mid body. It's kind of like pulling in a wet hot dog. They're, you're not going to get a fight out of them, but you hook them with rod and reel. They are going to pull backing. They're going to tear a line. Um, and with that, you can use a three weight all the way up to an eight weight, just depending on, you know, what you uh, think you might get into. In some small creeks, you're only targeting two foot fish. They might weigh a couple of pounds, three weights fine. You might be out on the big river system, the Canadian, the Cimarron, where you've got six footers of those long nose gar that might, might be 30, 40 pounds. And in those cases, you'd be electing to use like an eight weight. And that eight weight is really going to help you throw those rope lures. Cause especially you start getting into the four, five, six, seven, eight inch, you know, class of that rope tied to a swivel. It's going to have more weight on it than your jig fly or your, uh, or your woolly bugger. It's going to kind of be in between that bead head and that jig fly. So they're going to be a little bit tougher to throw on the smaller weight classes, but seven or eight weight, you can have a lot of fun with gar. Um, that would, that's really my recommendation for uh, warm water starting out for the non game. And then as you get more into it, you start going after things like carp, Buffalo river suckers, drum. Um, you can really get more into that, but a good starting off big fish, fun fight, fairly easy to catch and you can tie your own lures um, is going after gar, especially 
late April, all the way through May, early June, when they're in that spawning cycle. Um, with that, uh, that kind of brings me through everything. Uh, we, there's 20 minutes left, but we'll end this early if we don't have any more questions. Um, again, you know, you're, you're a little limited here in Oklahoma as far as fly shops go. So you got Bass Pro, you got Cabela's, and then you got the fly shop in Oklahoma City. You've got Beaver's Bend Fly Shop uh, down in the state park. And aside from that, you're more than likely, if you want to get specialty stuff, you're going to be ordering online or you're going to be traveling out of state to go to more specialty fly shops. Um, but here for your warm water species, keeping it simple, you know, especially if you're learning to fly fish or you're just trying to get better at it, this is the time of year to do it. It's not doing it during trout season. You get out there during trout season, a lot more opportunities to get frustrated. You might not be matching with the right bugs. Those fish can be finicky. They can get heavily pressured. Um, with all of our different warm water species from April all the way through October, you're going to get a wide range of fish that are going to take strikes at a lot of different types of bugs that you're going to be able to throw at them. Um, casting isn't as important, but it's a good place to learn how to cast, knowing that when you splash it down on the water, when you weren't trying to, it's not going to cost you the fish. It's not going to spook every fish in the run or the pool uh, like it will if you're on like a true trout stream. Um, Learning, you know, how to put your fly line on, attach your leader line, tie on, tip it. Those are things that you can do at your house that you can get accustomed to. That way, when you're out on the water, you got a lot of moving pieces. You know, you get that adrenaline going, especially you got fish activity all around you. You're trying to get into them. The more prepared you are to be able to tie on your flies, to tie on your tippet, be able to keep yourself going throughout the course of the day. That's really going to go a long ways to not only improving your experience then, but helping you build confidence and really keeping you engaged in the sport. Cause like all fishing, it's not fun to go fishing and not catch fish. We all enjoy the outdoors. We all enjoy it's a better day, you know, bad day of fishing beats a, uh, a good day, at just about anything else, especially work. But you know, that that's relative. A, a bad day of fishing can be a bad day of fishing. So, you know, you don't want it to be because you're either trying to do too much. You're trying to do techniques that you're not prepared for. You're not ready for. You're going to build your way to get there over time. Um, so starting off with the, the most basic, easy ways to catch fish, which you can, it's going to be these warm water species and it's going to be on ponds, small rivers and creeks. And while you're doing it and having a blast because you're catching a ton of fish, you're getting a ton of action, you are going to be teaching yourself how to fly fish during. It. So it's a lot better to learn while doing, while having success than it is to maybe not know quite what you're doing, uh, getting out there, going after species or trying things that are very more on the advanced end of the fishing spectrum and then not having success because fishing and hunting are confidence building sports. And the one thing you don't want to do is shoot yourself in the foot walking right out the door because you're trying something that you're just not ready for. Um, and you're going to be able to get into a ton of fish and learn all the stuff um, and really enjoy it, really get to enjoy the fly fishing aspect. Because once that cast comes to you, once the knot tying comes to you, once the reading the water and picking the right bug starts to come to you, a lot of people never go back. They end up just fly fishing for every species and they just, you know, they're done with the the bait fishing. They're done with the the bait casters and the spin casters, artificial lures, you know, they just stick strictly to fly because there is a lot of rewarding elements to it from just the casting to the very different types of hook sets, the way the fish fights. Um, there's just a lot of really cool elements of fly fishing. And um, one of the things that you just don't get a lot of is the warm water aspect. It's just, you know, people trout, trout fish, or they go marine saltwater fishing, but Lots of great opportunities here in Oklahoma for a wide swath of the year to be able to get yourself into fish uh, while learning how to fly fish. So that's great. Um, so with that, I don't see any more questions. Uh, we appreciate y'all being here. Can't do it without you. I always like to say we're not, uh, not an appropriated agency, so we don't get any state tax dollars. So we are completely funded from fishing and hunting license sales, as well as every time you go buy fishing or hunting equipment, marine fuel goes into an excise tax with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And that's what people like myself, we apply for grants every year and we get a big piece of that pot comes right back to us to help us do programs where we can do things like this and do educational programs. So 
really, really appreciate y'all being here. Anything that I can do to help ever, you have my contact information. If you got the email, if you didn't, you just hopped on. So we're doing a live feed, go to wildlifedepartment.com, go to our fishing resources page down there at the bottom. It's going to have my email and my cell call, text, email, anytime, try to get back to you as quickly as possible. You're going to get better response rate for me, email and text. Um, and I'll either get you the answer or I'll get you to the person or the resource that's going to give you a better answer than I can. Uh, these courses are tailored to getting beginning and people who may not get to spend a lot of time on the water. Uh, the best tips that we can provide for here in Oklahoma so that when you do get out there, we you know appreciate the fact that not everybody can be out on the water 365 days a year. For some of us, it's just a couple weekends. You want to be able to maximize those opportunities. That's what these courses are tailored for. And hopefully you have some success, takes you down the road, you learn more about fishing. And by doing that, you are doing us a huge favor by becoming skilled outdoors people because you are the ones who will then pass on those traditions through your family, through your friends, through your colleagues. And that's what's really going to keep the North American model of conservation going and allow for hunting and fishing to be available to anybody who wants it here without the, you know, allows us to have public land and public water. So without you, no public land, no public water. Keep it up. Spread the love, spread the fishing, spread the hunting, and uh, anything that we can ever do to help. We're, that's what we're here for. So appreciate y'all being here. Enjoy the rest of your week. We are in the peak of fishing across the state right now. This week is the week moving forward. So we're in it now. Fishing reports are great across the state from largemouth bass to temperate bass. Catfish are starting to pick up. Sunfish are starting to pick up. Crappie are up on the bank. Sogeye, walleye everything's active right now. So if you can get out, get fishing this weekend, this week, great week for it. Otherwise we look forward to the next few months of really tremendous fishing here throughout the state of Oklahoma. So until next time, we'll see you. Take care, stay safe, and thanks for joining us.